Today on Lightning Bugs. When most kids were just playing all the time, uh, you were working. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, there's, my mom always tells a story that when I was in West Side Story when I was 10, I would be climbing a tree in our front yard and she'd be like, Nick, you have to get out of the tree. We need to make half hour. <laughs> we need to beat the rush hour traffic. Um, so I'm sure that my parents, you know, would have wanted me to climb a few more trees, but I was very, very into performing at a very young age. And that was your, that was your drive. Yes, that was. And I, wow. I'm lucky to say I did not have the stage parents that pushed me into the <laughs> industry. If anything, they were like, honey, you don't have to do this. And I was like, no. I'm just kind of get, kind of getting a, a, a grip on someone with that much focus that young. Yeah, I mean, well, I, I, I was doing community theater and I, I loved it. And I think it was floating around some idea about an agent or representation and management. I think I attached myself to that idea, not really knowing yeah, what that meant. I can see that. And my, my mom tells the story that I walked into the kitchen one day and was like, did you get me an agent yet? And she was like, <laughs> Hi, if you're enjoying listening to Lightning Bugs, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. It helps a lot. I'm just going to start off with the intro and then we can be normal after that. If, Great. If there's such a thing. <laughs> yeah. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Lightning Bugs. Today, my guest is actor, singer, dancer, Nicholas Barish. He made his Broadway debut at 10 years old in the 29, oh, 2009. I tried to be cool with that. 20, 2009 revival of West Side Story. Nicholas next appeared in two acclaimed roundabout theater company revivals, The Mystery of Edwin Drood and She Loves Me. For his role, and you're nodding like, yeah, that's correct. <laughs> okay, good. Thanks. I'll just keep an eye on you and make sure that it's all right. Uh, for his role in She Loves Me, Nicholas received the 2016 Dorothy Loudon Award for Excellence in the Theater, as well as nominations for Drama Desk and Outer Critics Circle Awards. He's performed in many off-Broadway shows, as well as film and television. Nicholas currently stars as Orpheus in the first Broadway national tour of the hit musical Town. Ladies and gentlemen, Nicholas Barish. One, two, three. How's it going? Good. How are you? Thank you for that intro. It's very yeah. Good. Sure. yeah. Is it all basically right. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Man, so um, I guess I should have this in here. How old are you now? I'm 23. 23. Yes. Yeah, my, my son and daughter are uh, 22, turning 23 in uh, July. There you go. Yeah, I turned 24 in May. It's a great age, it's, uh, but it's also terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny. A friend of mine uh, uh, once was lamenting that his son was, he's like, oh, you know, my kid, this is a few years ago. He's like, my kid, he's 23 years old. And he just like works at Dairy Queen and gets stoned all the time. And then he said, I guess I was getting stoned all the time when I was 23 too. <laughs> Except I invented the parametric EQ that year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, there's everyone's on their own, their own journey. <laughs> that's right. And that's, and that's why we're here. Cause yours is uh, unique. I think of the um, guest I've had so far this year uh, in that, I mean, you were, when most kids were just playing all the time, uh, you were working. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, there's, my mom always tells a story that when I was in West Side Story when I was 10, I would be climbing a tree in our front yard and she'd be like, Nick, you have to get out of the tree. We need to make half hour. <laughs> we need to beat the rush hour traffic. Um, so I'm sure that my parents, you know, would have wanted me to climb a few more trees, but I was very, very into performing at a very young age. And that was your, that was your drive. Yes, that was. And I, wow. I'm lucky to say I did not have the stage parents that pushed me into the <laughs> industry. If anything, they were like, honey, you don't have to do this. And I was like, is, no. it, is that an assumption a lot of people make since you uh, started young is that you've got total stage parents? I think so. And just when you enter a job at a young, you know, 10, 11 years old, I think people just get a little uncomfortable or nervous. They're like, what is the situation? What is the motivation here? Um, but no, they, they knew that I loved it. And so they were very supportive, which I'm grateful for. 10 years. That's, that's at the end of a long 10 year journey to get there. What were, what were you <laughs> thinking before that? Like, like, like at what point, uh, 
I'm just kind of get, kind of getting a, a, a grip on someone with that much focus that young. Yeah, I mean, well, I, I, I was doing community theater and I, I loved it. Uh, and I think it was floating around some idea about an agent or representation and management. I think I attached myself to that idea, not really knowing yeah, what that meant. I can see that. And my, my mom tells the story that I walked into the kitchen one day and was like, did you get me an agent yet? And she was like, <laughs> what? Um, so I, <laughs> Um, so I, I, and then I signed with one miraculously because through, you know, the the head of our children's troop, um, in Westchester, New York, they, they knew a a professional manager and she got us in touch and I started going out on auditions and it was very, just kind of, my parents were taking it one day at a time and they were like, he probably, you know, won't book anything, but we'll try it out. And, and then I ended up getting West Side Story a few months later and, my mom broke out in hives because she realized she had to drive her kid to, a, you know, 47th Street, which is an hour away, eight shows a week for the next year or whatever. So wow. <laughs> the reality. Well, what, what did what did you imagine when you thought, you know, to get um, to get an agent? Did you see yourself on on stage specifically or did you imagine more television and, and film? I think stage because I that was all I had been doing. Uh, you know, I was just doing musicals with this children's theater troupe and community theater. So I think, you know, I've been singing and doing impressions since I was very little. So the fact that people, I could do that and then people were clapping for me was very enticing. <laughs> the bug, yeah. the bug bit. Yeah. Well, I remember being, I mean, I was, I must have been about 10 years old, and um, this is way long time ago, and HBO had just started, and uh, Neil Sedaka was on HBO, and I thought, this is the this is the coolest thing I've ever seen, because in that area, right. you really didn't make it sound like the olden times too much, but you really didn't yet see performers, and seeing right. him on television, he told a story that he got his first song published when he was 13, and for me, that's that was it. It's like, I have to have a song published by the time I'm 13 years old. And I was 13. Once I got 13, I still, I remembered that. And it was just really hard on myself because I didn't have anything published. Uh, I didn't know what that meant, but it kind of like you, right. I think is, is a little bit of like, oh, I need to get a manager. Like a right. grown up so goes, no, what am I going to do with the manager? And you were like, I need a manager. I don't know what to, right. To know it's possible, I guess. Although I'm trying to be better about, you know, comparing myself to others and just realizing that, it is very unusual, the, the position I was in at 10 years old. So, you know, leave it yeah. at that. Well, I think a lot of kids have a lot more focus younger than we think. Yeah, you know? I do and, too. And, and, Absolutely. and you getting some success at it young is uh, unusual. But, I mean, shit, if you were singing as well as you sing now or anywhere close when you were 10 years old, just your voice alone is enough reason to – to give you a job. I mean, well, you, you're seeing you. your ass off. Yeah. <laughs> I, I try. I try. How did that go like over the course of your teenage years then? I mean, your voice would have changed a little bit. You have to navigate a new mm-hmm. instrument a couple yes. times probably. Yeah. It's a very good question. I uh, My voice started changing around 12, 13, and I, I was involved in a show that I did out in LA and it was a, a like the pre-Broadway run of the show and my voice was starting to change. So my, my range was getting limited and more and more limited. And, and also the texture and the quality was That's starting the to main go. thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that freaked me out for sure. Cause I knew, you know, I, I good enough ear that I can, I, I know what the, the difference is between my best and not my best. So that was, that was scary. And luckily I had voice teachers who were helping me through that transition. Cool. And my manager unbeknownst to me just kept telling my mom, He's not. He's not going to work in his teen years. Kids just don't work in their teen years. Right. They're growing. They're changing. Their voices aren't what they. You know. And um, when I did the myst- I did the mystery of Edwin Drew at age fourteen, which was also a rare thing. But um, I think the awkwardness worked for me. In right. That case, you used it. You know. And I. So I mean, at the time, I didn't know <clears throat> quite how awkward I was. But I look back, and I. You know. Um, but I'm grateful that that transition happened and it happened over a year or two, you know, and I found more of my adult voice. Yeah, no, I can imagine that that'd be tough because I mean, but it doesn't stop. I mean, throughout your life, you yeah. you wake up some years and realize it's a slightly different instrument you're working with. Yeah, 
And I, and I, I mean, I have an amazing voice teacher, Neil Harrelson, <clears throat> and he works in the musical theater world, but also the opera world. <clears throat> Excuse me. I love when we start all singers, when you start talking about your voice, <clears throat> <laughs> we are not. <laughs> Just testing the rain. Yeah. Um, but he, he says that his best days are in his fifties or, you know, uh -huh. and it's not till you're 30 until your full voice starts to emerge. So I, I have stuff to look forward to. So I'm, I'm happy about that. Oh, uh, I, I think that's probably true. No, I think that's probably true. From singers I've I've uh I've known. Yeah, because you um well you relax about certain things and if you're well, like with anything with 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 art if you're willing to go with it. You know, right. a big one is uh you know Tom Waits. Yeah. Well, I mean, he ruined his voice on tour. It was a I want to say I don't know exactly. I want to say it was like a probably a a, a busted blood vessel or something. Now he could have, he was, I think he was in Europe and he could have, he'd made a record with a pretty voice. And then he had this fucking throat chisel and he was on tour right. and he should have gone to the doctor to fix it. And then he'd been yeah. fine. But he decided right. it was something to work with. He was like, right. I'm enjoying this. Right. I and mean, then there's the physical, physiological component, which is hard. I mean, I know nothing about how it works. Um, Really? But yeah, something to, to, to you know, think about. <clears throat> so you're, you're not terribly analytical about it? Like you don't talk about the retinoids and the blah, blah, blahs? And <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> but my, my voice teacher does, and I go, oh, that's interesting. Can I sing this well right now, please? And, you know, <laughs> I'm not very patient, <laughs> you know. Um, but yeah, it's fascinating. You know, there's, yeah. there's always more to learn. Yeah. Do, do you identify as a... Um, at this point, more as a, a, a singer, if you had to, to lean, or actor? That's a good question. I mean, I, I think I'm an actor because I, the, the singing almost feels like some, something I was born with. Mm -hmm. that there's, there's, there's so much to learn you know, in terms of technique. But as an actor, I feel like there's so many nuances and the subjectivity, like, you know, you can, you can pretty much anyone on the planet can hear a very good singer and a singer who's tone deaf and know the difference. But yeah. I think when it comes to acting, it's like, Oh, I, I like that performance. I, I didn't care for it. And so I think there's just, there's a broader kind of spectrum of, um, of what makes a good actor or a smart actor or a Shakespearean actor or a TV actor. I mean, you know, there's just, yeah. So I, I, I would like to identify as an as an actor who can who can sing, I guess. But yeah, no, I, <laughs> I think that I think that makes sense. The, the the singing part does seem to come supernatural, uh, supernatural, very naturally to you. Yeah. When you're doing a um, when you, you now I'm thinking about the studio uh, recording where I might do six takes, and I'm pretty damn sure that the second take was great, and the third take was crap. And and I have these ideas, but most of the time I hear it back, I'm proven wrong. I've realized I don't have a good a good ear for that. Yeah, you know, in 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 your business of of so much stage, do you think you kind of know when your good nights are? Uh, I I've been thinking about this lately a lot because I <laughs> I think I saw an interview with Audra McDonald talking about this with her director, Lonnie Price, for Lady Day at, at Emerson's Bar and Grill, that play she did on Broadway. And she talks about how she would come, af come out after a show and tell Lonnie, oh, oh I wasn't in it. And oh, and, and he was like, no, you, you were great. We didn't see any of what was going on in your head. So I, I, I try to remember that and think of that because there's some shows where I'm, I'm like, oh, I, feel, I feel like I'm really in the pocket. Yeah. And then there are times where I'm like, oh, I was ahead of it or I was behind it. And I, I ha I've been talking to my cast members about this because I, I have to remember that the audience really isn't going to know or care. And it's just my neurosis that's probably just getting in the way. Or maybe they know more than we do in a way. Yeah. I mean, right, right. there may be something to that because like, I have very little uh, experience acting. But the experiences that I have, I'm thrown into really big productions and 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 yeah. all of a sudden all there all this money is being spent and it's like I'm obviously kind of the kindergarten uh a guy I'm worried about things like lines and I was working <laughs> with a director recently who was like no nah, just just throw those lines away 
Just throw those away. Just throw those I love away. That note. Yeah, like and 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 like you know, I, the, I don't know what the what the typical you know uh, cliche notes are, but I did that. I just said the lines. I think that's what she meant. And yeah. I have to say, there was really something to that. Totally. Uh, and yes. and and it seems just as soon as I got my head around that, then there wasn't something to it anymore. Then there was more to listening, and then yes. then I was listening. And then that sucked. Like, so I started thinking, okay, I'm listening. And I saw these dailies come back. And like <laughs> the, the person I'm playing the, 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 the scene with would say something. And I would just be like, like <laughs> staring, listening. Like it was not, no one listens that way. So I think what you do is just like from a punter's point it's, of view. It's hard, but you bring up that point of, you know, as soon as I start thinking, for me, it's really, it's all over. Uh, and I, I did a show. We we have five show weekends on tour, which is super challenging, and we have six thirty shows on Sundays after a matinee. And I was so fatigued. Jeez. I told my co star, I was she was very vivid in color in front of me, and was almost kind of like, and I, I was like, <laughs> am I hallucinating right now? But but I realized that I was so tired, like fully wanted to close my eyes on stage that I couldn't think. Yeah, And therefore I was just doing, and I was probably like, Ugh, unfortunately, Nick, this is probably some of your best work because you're, you're just going through the motions and trusting the moment as opposed to, you know, forcing something. So no, I think that's actually really big. And I think it's something yeah. everyone that performs, we all have to come to grips with that. It actually hurts your feelings to think that the best thing that you've done was because you were out of your own way because you were so right. exhausted that there was you didn't have the faculties to fuck your own right. roll up. It's awful. Exactly. I know that we just want control so badly, but we have to give it up sometimes. Yeah. I'll tell you the worst. I I got a concussion falling off stage before a show even started. So I, this was in um uh, uh, Hir Hiroshima in Japan. And they're like, ladies and gentlemen, pivots, or whatever it is that they say. Because normally I wouldn't get an intro, but I remember there was an intro. And I walked into the darkness and there's normally tape in front of the piano. There wasn't. And it was just, I stepped into a five feet fall onto my head, straight forward. Oh, Climbed back up on the stage. I, I played the rest of the show, went to the hospital, had a pretty severe concussion. Managed to stay awake for the whole thing. For the rest of the tour, my band was like, you have never played this well. Like, you are, and I was just barely getting through. They're like, no, seriously, like, your playing is outstanding. Okay, so I have to be injured and and and, and brain concussed right, in order like, to be good? <laughs> right, like, I can't. I can't tell if that's really what I want to hear right now, but thank you. <laughs> yeah, oh my gosh, wow. That's, but these things wow. are lessons for performers. I mean, we all have to have that lesson. It's like... Yes. And I don't even know how to analyze it. Do you? I mean, what does that mean? Your training's not worth anything, or the things that you think, or your analysis is worth nothing? Because I don't yeah, believe that's the case. Guess, I mean, one of my uh, teachers, Bob Krakauer, who's a renowned acting teacher, but he talks about how you you do the work, and then when you show up, you have to throw it away. Yeah, and you know, it's kind of that note that you got to throw it away. But it's like, yeah. how does one? throw away something when you totally. just want to do well and you, you know, I struggle with perfectionism and um, it's helpful. Lately, I found it's helpful to just look at the other actor, look at, you know, and try to listen without over listening or, you know, um, pushing myself and to just be there and, and trust it. But it's, it's very challenging. Yeah. Oh, uh, I think it's, I think everyone who has ever watched, you know, even just television should take like, you know, maybe a semester's worth of taking a role in acting. It would be very interesting to most people yeah. who've never done it before. It's it's such a trip. Now, this is. is a this is a podcast about creativity, and I have been trying to sort of, um, you know, establish in a way what even creativity is. Do you, how, how much of that do you think is in acting? What's 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 your take on creativity? In in uh, in acting and performance, hmm. um, I mean, going into I, you know my reference point right now is this role because I'm very in it. Yeah. But I, when I went into Hades Town, it was very um, it was new for me because it was already in a, an established show on Broadway, right. hit Broadway show. I was walking into a role that someone else originated, and so the rehearsal process 
was kind of a push and pull between, mm. okay, I need to serve this piece and as it is on Broadway right now. And that is more, I don't know how much of my creative brain was, was used there, but luckily okay. I had a director who did not give me notes on this song or that song. And so I was able to go home and think, okay, I have some leeway here to, to create and to put my own spin on it. Um, so in the rehearsal process for, for a show like this, it, that's where it, the creativity happened. And I was lucky because, you know, you could have a director who could say, do this, say it this way and say it that way. And then yeah. you're in your head and you're like, am, am I being creative? Right yeah, now? the first guy um, did it this way. Right, right. So I think, yeah, I mean, with theater, it's great because every night you have a chance to do it again and discover new things. I think it's very different for TV and film. Um, and I haven't done enough of it yet to know how to how to use all my creativity on set and how to use it, you know, to the best of my ability. Um, because, you know, I, I just have to get used to the lingo. And, and, and you know, in my, in, in, in my limited experience, like especially sitting around the, the table read portion, you know, there's always two or three actors on these things who try to improvise. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I wish mm-hmm. they wouldn't. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Improvising is definitely creative, but it can also screw things up. Um, and that's, yeah, it's a whole other conversation, but yeah, it, it's a, it's a, it's a balance, but I just, I, I find it so fun to be on stage every night mm. live because I think I can't help but be creative. You know, I'm, I'm put in a position where I, I have to be. I have to tell the story for this new crop of people. Mm-hmm. Um, so I know the creative juices are are flowing. Um, but yeah, it's it's uh, finding finding how how exactly to be fulfilled creatively in a job, especially as demanding as this one is. Um, I have to remember, no, Nick, like this is a this is a this is a play. <laughs> it's right. entertainment and it's creative and it's fun and you know to be so serious about it. You know, right? So, yeah, <laughs> I mean, I I think that. Um, I'm starting to think that almost any uh, occupation or endeavor can be extremely creative, whether it's, you know, uh, architecture or being a barber or landscaper or, you know, hopefully you're not too terribly creative if you're an accountant, you know, you get in trouble (laughs) for that. But uh, but most things you can be. And then there, 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 there are all of the things that we do in the arts and the assumption is, is that they're creative. Mm. And, you know, I, you know, my gig, you know, some of it's very creative and make a song. Other times yeah. I feel like I'll wind up, I'm just doing what I'm told, even if I'm the one yes. that told me to do it. If, if yesteryear me told me to do it and I do it over right. and over again. Uh, do you, are there things in your life that are significantly creative that, that aren't professional? And it's even making an omelet, you know. Totally. I mean... Cooking is not my strong suit, but over the pandemic, I, um, you know, didn't have a lot of acting or singing to do. So I, I did The Artist's Way, which I'm sure you're familiar with, the Julia yeah. Cameron book. Um, and that that really changed things for me because okay. I'm, I'm in a family of writers. I've always wanted to write, but didn't really feel like that was my place or avenue mm-hmm. to try it. Um, and, and she gave me the confidence to she meaning Julia in the, in her pages to, to start writing and putting things down on paper. And that as an actor, you know, there's not a lot of control. And I think, especially just in the industry and it was the first time I realized, Oh, I can put something on paper. That's only from my head and whether it's good or bad, you know, it doesn't matter, but at least it's mine, you know, and I can. Do you follow the morning pages ritual? I sure do. I, I try to do it every day. Um, and it's funny because I find myself <laughs> trying to to write sometimes as opposed to just what yeah. she wants you to vomit everything, um, which always ends up being more helpful when I'm like, I hate this, I hate that, I hate this person. <laughs> <You know>? because, <laughs> because then you realize how insane your own thoughts are and you're like, yeah. Nick, we got to calm down. Like this is, you know, um, but it definitely clears my head and I've, I've benefited a lot from that. You have... Um- aspirations then since you were you know you you were you're achieving 
goals that you sort of set for yourself when you were nine and a half. So, uh, how, <laughs> uh, do you, do you, do you have, uh, is writing or, or is there, is there something else on the horizon that, um, that you're, that, that you want to go for? Yeah. I mean, like I said, I, I do want to do more TV and film to just change it up and also to learn more. Um, and, but yeah, writing is definitely the next thing I'd like to put my attention towards. And, uh, you know, being on the road, like, as you know, there isn't a whole lot of time for <laughs> other things. Yeah, um, that's right. Uh, you know, in, in this job in particular. But yeah, I, I'd like to write, I'd like to write more, right, for the stage. I wrote a little one act play. And um, I, I'm in a family full of editors, and I sent yeah. it through the uh, family editors, and they okay. had positive thoughts, which is amazing because we're very critical of each other. <laughs> so well, this is interesting. So if you're if your fan, you know, you're used to seeing the process of writing, and part of it being editing. While you're writing, do you feel you're over editing yourself naturally, or where do you sit more on morning pages spew? Or closer to, I because I, I'm a self editor and I have to work at that. I yeah. have to make sure that I, I I stop it, stop stop writing stop the critique it. of this. Write yes. the fucking piece. Yeah, I I mean I found I, I was writing at night probably again because I was exhausted and couldn't mm-hmm. overthink it. And I know a lot of that's you know a common time to 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 be creative at night. But um, so yeah, that probably helped me get out of my head and. Uh, and yeah, I think when it's when it's goofy and silly and when it's again for me it's about you know steering away from the seriousness of it all. And so mm. when I'm having fun putting something on paper or or even on the stage, it tends to be the thing that's rewarded most. Mm-hmm. Um yeah. Well, let's uh let's uh let's get the question and then we can both take a stab at answering it with our infinite wisdom. Hi, I was just wondering how you treat different forms of acting, like on-screen acting versus voice acting, and how you think venue changes in acting performance. I'm going to let you have that one, because I don't act much. Yeah, I mean, I um, uh, in terms of voice acting, I haven't done a ton of, of voiceover work, but I'll speak to the, the venue question, because that's, that's really fascinating and something I did not discover until I was on tour. I mean, even just the acoustics of a house... Um, mm. last week we were in East Lansing, Michigan and, uh, our, our engineer, our sound, um, uh, sound team said that this house is very, what did they call it? Live. Live. Yes. That's it. Right. So, and I went, Oh, okay. I don't really know what that means. But then when you get on stage and you hear this, a lot of, you know, reverb, I don't know the technical terms, but, that's it. um, so, so yeah. And so then I'm hearing my own voice and I'm, maybe not wanting to edit it, but lean into the fact that I have more freedom. <laughs> you just, mm. in terms of, um, you know, if, if a note is like a teensy bit flat or I want to use vibrato a little more here, it's going to, you know, resonate a little differently in this house. So, so vocally it's, it's been interesting to calibrate, um, in the moment. Uh, and then, you know, in terms of just audiences and another thing I love about theater is you never know how they're going to react to a certain yes. moment. A laugh that always happens may not happen. And <laughs> you might think I am all of a sudden not funny. Yeah. Or at the end, you know, not to spoil it in, in, from my show, it's it's not a happy ending. And um, there was someone uh, really going through it in the front row sobbing. Mm. Mm. And of course, that's going to affect me on stage because I it's loud and it's in my ear. Um, so that's what keeps it exciting too on a on a daily basis is. Um, just seeing how people how people react, um, and in in this COVID world, we don't have a lot of interaction with audience members, so that's how I kind of gauge their responses on stage. Um, I don't know if that fully answered your question. It, no, I thought that was a great answer, especially um, interested in the um, the the acoustic the acoustics mm-hmm. part. Something people don't think about, but part of your live environment is the liveliness of your room. I mean, yeah, sometimes. Um, I'm sure, and I guess it's probably the right thing to do to slow down. This is my experience is slowing down, articulating more, leaving space between words because it's, you know, one syllable is still going when the next one 
starts right. because you're in the biggest men's room ever designed. And, right. um, and you want people to, to understand you're communicating. But now totally. when, you hear, when you hear a recording of that back, if the room is not in the recording and it's a close sounding recording, it can sound utterly insane. <laughs> Which is like, who is my audience? The recording or the audience? Because sometimes you're recording live and um, and all the things that you think, okay, well, the audience and I are both on Mars tonight. There's something in the air. This is fucking crazy. It feels like everything should go fast. You know, and then you hear it come yeah. back and you're like, what drugs w- was I on? <laughs> yeah, it's so true. And it's so, it's so tiny, these nuances, but... It, yeah. Yeah. You think you have the audience's number usually now within the first two or three, you know, reaction spots. Like if they like this, they're that kind of audience and they're going to like that. It's tough. It's really tough. I, we also have, we're in houses where the, they're far back and there's also a COVID divide yeah. so mm-hmm. even farther back than they normally are. Um, so sometimes it's really hard. And actually one of our associate directors had to tell us the other day, Guys, trust me, they're with you. I know right. that you can't hear them and feel them. Um, but there's a, there's a couple, I would say, laugh lines for me that, you know, once I get them, I'm like, phew. Um, right. Hurdles. Yeah. Laugh hurdles. hurdles. Yeah. Yeah, that's probably, I suppose that's the worst, really. Uh, you know, throwing a joke grenade that doesn't go off. Yeah. That's it's not the best that's, feeling. That's pretty rough. Because it's not really like you had, you know, someone sobbing in the front row, but you don't need, you don't need that reaction. Right. You know, you can know that they're moved and you don't have, they don't have to be going for their hanky. But, exactly. Uh, but when you say some stupid shit and it's like last night, they're like, <laughs> tonight. Yeah. Like, yeah. And especially, I mean, in our show, it's, it's not a comedy. So I think we squeeze out the laughs that we can get. And, um, <laughs> and um, <laughs> if they don't happen, we're like, well, you know, you all are really in for it because, you know, things take a turn. <laughs> yeah. yeah have, you, have you thought about make, uh, uh, making an album, uh, making writing songs, just doing something that was completely uh, <sighs> um, musical? Yes, I have thought about writing songs. I'm not sure yet whether I have the talent or the discipline to do that. My mom's a songwriter oh. and uh, she's so good at it. And I, I don't know. I'd like to try it. Um, in terms of an album, people have suggested that that might be something I would want to do. Um, but I don't know yet whether it would be original music or covers or classical right. or musical theater or pop or there's so many questions in the air that I think I'm just not. I mean, I think, right I, I think the best answer to that usually for me is what's the album that you want to hear? Like, right. But, and, 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 and not, not the one that you want to hear you do, but it's, mm. I mean, that sometimes, you know, as, as a mu- music listener, music fan, I'll, I'll put on parts of, albums and parts of stuff and realize it's not, that's not really it. That's not really what I'm wanting to hear. That's not really what I'm wanting to hear. I want to hear a little bit of that, but, and then you're like, the only way that I'm going to get to sit down on the sofa and listen to a front to back thing that I really want to hear is I'm going to have to make that. So like, boy, if I were, if I were the King, I'd make that record right there. Right. And and I think that's the best way to do it. Like if you, just sitting on the sofa and you're like, what do I want to hear? Not your ego is not attached to it or anything. Just mm. what do you want to hear? Um, then just make it like make it tired. So you don't That's think great. about it. Like we're. That's great. That's great advice. Yeah. I love that. I mean, do you want to hear also- an album that has songs that you already know? Cause as a singer, you'd be like, Oh, I can imagine doing that. But when you hear those songs, is that what, I don't know. Like what, how do you hear? First thing, is, I, first thing that comes I, to your mind, if I said, just what's the album you want to hear? It's, it's probably at this point a Stephen Sondheim because I right. I love him and, and he just passed and that's what I've been listening on repeat. But I think I also just get overwhelmed because there's so much great music out there that's and true. my ego definitely is like, well, what can you do? What can you right. contribute? But uh, but of course we can all, we can all contribute um, more. And there's only, what, 88, 86, 88 keys? So yeah. 
There's only so much you can do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, really, there's 11 notes, you know. Yeah. <laughs> right, um, 11 notes, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, I think that has always been, like, you're at the age now where you're being, you're being thoughtful, you know, like, when we jump into our first discipline, mm. we didn't stop to ask, do we need another actor? Do you need another musician? You're like, let <laughs> That's me That's right. Right. I, I'm doing this. Then later, if you begin to cross uh, genres and disciplines, yes. then that's the question, you know? Right. I, I don't think that that's a, I think that's a, um, that's a very thoughtful thing to think about. Like, like that's very yeah. nice. It's like, we've got so much music, like, I don't want to impose on you, but I think, you know, I think in, impose, do it. Impose, Why do yeah. we need an extra one? I don't know. Because, right. because someone wants to hear what you have to say. Right. You know, it yeah, doesn't matter how many people. Thinking about that word audacity too, which mm. Julia Cameron talks about in Artist Way as well, where it's like talent yeah. can, talent is talent, but unless you do something with it, <laughs> it just sits there, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, so. It does. Yeah. And, and, and the reason I'm even doing this podcast is because of the number of people I talked to who were, you know, full grown ass adults who had a passion for something and felt they were not, it wasn't appropriate. It's like, right. you know, that's not what I do. Like, we don't, and I had done yeah. that myself. Like I, I was spending a good deal of my thirties and forties photographing and everyone's like, oh, I'll make a, a book of photographs. I'm like, why would I litter the world with that when there are great right. photographers right. out there right. who are doing right. it, you know? Mm -hmm. And now I look back on that, think, you know, that's its own kind of ego issue there. That's like, don't question it. You don't know. Just, I say, just, just, just do it. So I, do I hope it, you make right. a record because, because you sing your ass off. And I just think, you know, so many of us are making records for all different kinds of reasons. And it'd just be neat to hear one with your voice on it. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And yeah, it's, it's on the, it's on the, <clears throat> some sort of bucket list. So it's on the list. <laughs> now, now I have to make it a reality. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you're working. And I'm working. Yes. And traveling. And traveling, which I'm very grateful for. Um, but yes, time is time is also a, a factor. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's right, because you're not in any different position than if I talk to uh, you know, I don't know, I said a, an architect to begin with. Yeah. Who said, I'm working all the time. I don't have time to make an album. <laughs> That's what you're doing. You right. know, like it's, it's you're so trying funny, to find a, a Denny's that you won't get food poisoning at in, <laughs> in the Midwest somewhere at two o'clock in the morning after you roll up on the bus. I mean, Ben, when I tell you that that is painfully accurate, I don't even know how you came. I mean, that is wow. <laughs> I just I, had an my experience life. hearing that. Oh, shit. <laughs> I was oh, like, shit. Yeah. He knows. Yeah. 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 And 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 to be clear, before we have to edit this thing for um for you know corporate product placement reasons or not placement, I don't think that 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 any one place has the uh, has the uh, 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 corner on uh, bad food. By the way, so I had a lot of great moons over my hammy. It's all good. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. But you are you 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 are like you know that's an obstacle course for you to uh, you're getting rewarded for doing something that's sort of creative. Right now you're probably right. repeating yourself a, a lot, right? So you're getting rewarded for that. Totally. I, I, it's not any easier for you to jump into a singing career than it would be for my mother. In fact, it'd be easier for my mother. She's retired. <laughs> yeah, in a way, yes. And it's funny I, to the time speak to the time component. I was watching an interview with. Helena Bonham Carter for she was doing the oh. crown and she was like, actors are so pathetic because you know, you just want a job, you want a job, you're not working. And then you get the job and you're like, when are my days off? <laughs> it's just like pathetic, you know, oh but, um, there, the, that, those there, it, I did go from one extreme to the other in this particular case where I was sitting at home doing nothing. And now, you know, working a lot, um, finding the that was perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Helena's perspective. We love it. Normally, you know, actors are, um, I mean, I think of actors as being probably more, God, how do I say it? I don't, 
I mean, look, musicians are a lot more um, self-obsessed and self-centered than, say, you know, a barber would be or something, you know. Sure. Uh, but actors are up there. Like, like you guys oh, are absolutely. really thinking about yourself. But what's amazing to me about actors is that three quarters, if not more, of every actor's job is getting roles and rejection. Yeah. Yes. Rejection, 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 rejection. Yes. That's a, that's some kind of joke from God that 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 that's your lot that that mm -hmm. you have to put up with. I don't think your average person understands how much rejection a successful actor deals with. How, right. Where do you put that? Yeah, I mean that that's when I look back and I look at my 9, 10, 11 year old self and I think, you know what? I'm glad that that little kid was exposed that early to rejection mm. and had parents who was like who were, you know, said it's actually not you, you know, and, um, mm -hmm. the rejection is hard. Yeah. And especially when you go these long stretches without working. And then in this particular case, I'm, you know, one of the leads of this musical and it's, it's very people, you know, they, they love the show and you're getting so much great feedback all of a sudden mm -hmm. in your life. And you think, well, <laughs> When I, you know, didn't get those string of twenty jobs before, was that still the case? So it, it's one extreme to the other, um, and uh, but yeah, the rejection's hard, and I, I try to look at it as, you know, you you just have to do your best with whatever audition you're going mm -hmm. out on, and um, the my one of my teachers says, book the room, not the job. You know, if if you can kind of sprinkle your good work wherever you go eventually mm. the seeds that you plant will bloom blossom you know years later yeah. and i i'm starting to now realize that having been in the business for i guess over a decade now to that you do it's it's planting seeds and it is about relationships more than it's about booking that one job that you really wanted so try to keep that do, do you do do you do much um like the equivalent of a musician jamming. Like I know when I lived in LA, I knew actors that did improv and all kinds of just local stuff that didn't pay just because they yes. kept them busy and they did it. And then there was another kind just did not do that. Just all mm -hmm. auditions and gigs and that's it. Uh, do, you, do you have no, a part? No. Do, you, do, you, do you jam? Yeah. I mean, I, I try to do readings of friends works and new works and I, I have a practice group that I'm very grateful for where we we just run scenes and we give each other notes and sometimes awesome. of what of stuff other. that you're actually working on like like, yeah, like that you're in okay or you know someone will say hey I auditioned for this two weeks ago can we run it I feel like I didn't hit this moment or can I get feedback and mm -hmm. it's all working actors and and we give each other um feedback which is very helpful sometimes that's hurts, awesome but that's yeah you know what it is we say i think we our phrase is hit me <laughs> and, and it really uh does feel like that <laughs> but um but that's great and that keeps the the wheels greased and the, and the creativity flowing when you're I not think that's just smart. A, yeah yeah i think that's smart is there um you know if in 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 my gig which is i I'm sort of, I'm a songwriter first. That's the way I think of myself. Um, right. You know, it's, the the the, the dreaded malady is, um, uh, you know, writer's block, right? Mm -hmm. In yours, I guess it's stage fright. Yeah. Do you have, do, do, do you have, have you had moments where you just went out and, and and froze. What what what's your experience and, and your understanding of that? I think I'm I'm someone who's seen it on TV. Like you know, so mm -hmm. to me, it's like some Lawrence Olivier story where all of a sudden, after you know, fifty years on the stage, like just freezes up. Have you seen yeah. that or do that? Yeah, I think when I again back to just the overthinking. When I start to think about the fact that thousands of people have their eyes on me mm -hmm. and are watching my every move and are expecting greatness <laughs> as soon as yeah. i start to go down that path on stage i get really nervous um it's the moments when i'm again just more grounded and, and telling the story and remembering that i'm just a human being performing for other human beings yeah where it's it's more doable so i think when i start to think about the 
just the the gravity of you know the size of the theater or the show or the you know the role i get i get pretty nervous but before each show i don't get too nervous anymore, yeah which is which is good for me you're prepared yeah i think so i try to i try to do some you know pre-show rituals and remind myself of a few things and why i'm doing it and that it's a whole new audience and they don't know what to expect and they're not judging me as hard as I think that they, that they are. So. Yeah. 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 The mind is a terrible thing. <laughs> it um, is. So since you were, um, you know, you, you've done the artist way book, which I've never read myself. It seems like everyone I know has. And so by, yes. you know, I guess by, <laughs> by proxy, I know something about it, but mm-hmm. I hit up all my, um, guests to to give us an exercise to do for a week. Yeah. Did they prepare you about that? They did tell me. Great. I might, I might steal from Julia. I don't know if that's allowed. No, that's fine. I think it, okay. it, look, you're, you're our teacher for the week. So the, the thing is, is you're the boss of us and just tell us uh, uh, our new week's resolution. Yeah. I would say get up. It's very hard to do this, but longhand stream of consciousness. As soon as you get up, I do three pages. That's what Julia recommends. But you can do start with a page. Um, it's going to hurt a little bit. Mm-hmm. And just do it. And it, there's no expectation. You could literally, I mean, sometimes I write, you know, I have to pee. My nightmare was crazy. I hate mm. this. I'm tired. And to just do that, I think, separates you f- from your mind in a way. And you can you can have some distance and think, oh, wow, you know, it's not that bad. <laughs> It really isn't. So, um, is there anything you'd want to narrow it down to? Like you said, uh, uh, she keeps it at three pages. Do um, mm-hmm. you want to uh, amend any of it or make it a, a, a anything at all about it that we can be specific? Like everyone's going to get say, up in the morning and do this before coffee or anything? Before anything, the, as okay. soon as you get up, roll, okay. roll out, uh, sit down, start. I would say aim for three pages. If you can't get to three pages... That's okay. Is it important that it's um, written and not on a it computer? It has to be written and you can't pick up your pen. So wow. even if it's gibberish, okay. even if it's blah, 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 blah. Sometimes I repeat the same phrase and I say, what's next? What now? What now? What now? Right. I don't know. I don't know. And yeah. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So at the end of the three pages, put it up. You just put it up and move on. Drop the move mic. On. Done. I Do you ever read it again? Back. No. You never read it. You don't again. mind it for ideas. This is just fecal you, you matter can. for the brain. Um, okay. But for me, I'm scared what I'll find because <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't, I don't, I don't want to go back there. But it's a, it's just a good palate cleanser, and I think okay. the rest of your day you're a little more mindful. Yeah. Great. All right. Well, look, it's been really good to talk to you. Thank you very much for uh, thank you for so much, Ben. This has spending been great. your time with us. Thank you. Of course. Hi, if you're enjoying listening to Lightning Bugs, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. It helps a lot. Thank you oh so much for watching Lightning Bugs on YouTube. Check out more episodes and subscribe if you have not already. You can also listen to Lightning Bugs wherever podcasts may be found.